Before Matt comes to speak to us, um, we're going to have our scripture reading, which is from Matthew 9, um, beginning at verse 9. Matthew 9, verse 9. If you'd like to see a Bible and you haven't got one with you, there are some on the table at the back there. Please help yourself. So Matthew 9, beginning to read at verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Thanks be to God for his word. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Brian. Uh, amen. It's good to be back. It's been uh, probably a little over five years since I last joined you guys on the Sunday. Um, we went off on a wild adventure to Sheppey, and um, we we're having fun over there. Uh, Helen and the girls send their love. Um, I left them. I've brought my friend Tom over. We left uh, the rest of the church crew uh, doing a litter pick, which sadly has been rained off. Uh, so uh, I kind of feel like I've stitched them up a little bit. I've got to come and hang out with you guys, and I've left them in the rain. Um, so before Jeff left on sabbatical, he said, Matt, can you, can you come and help us uh, come and preach? And I was like, great, Jeff, mate, what would you like me to preach on eating and drinking? And I was like, okay, where do you begin? So this, what this isn't, is like Master Chef Unplugged. Okay, there's going to be no practical demonstrations on how to cook well. Uh, hands, uh, hold my hands up. I can only cook limited things well. The rest is guesswork. This isn't going to be anything like that. Um, I can make myself a cup of coffee, but that's about as far as my kind of drinking expertise goes. What we're going to look at today is why why Jesus ate and drank for people. Because if we want to follow Jesus and be a people who eat and drink with others, like Jesus ate and drank with people, we could spend loads of time looking at practical things. And you know what? We might do some of them for a couple of days, like, you know, New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to do this better. and I'm gonna... But if we don't grab the heart of why Jesus ate and drank with people, we'll never grow in the how to do it. And so the reason why I chose this passage is because I think Jesus just screams out in both his actions and his words why he is the God who came eating and drinking with people. What a guy. (laughs) That's a God that I can follow, one that likes a good meal and a nice drink. We are going to look at this morning at why Jesus did that. And then there's some observations that we can look at in how we can then off the back of that, learn how to grow. Just a few things, that I, I, observations I've noticed about Jesus in this passage. The Bible says, uh, re- re- refers to Jesus three times as the Son of Man came. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Tick. We, we, we sing about songs about that. We talk loads about that. We're all good with that, yeah? We like that. Jesus came to seek and save. Jesus came, the Son of Man came, Not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom. Now, we sing about that, don't we? We love that. We celebrate that. We talk about that lots. Big tick. Then the Bible says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, to the point where people thought that Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard. Now, that's quite extreme, eating and drinking. Like, this this isn't just like they saw Jesus at the cafe having a nice croissant and a nice cappuccino. They must have seen Jesus do a lot of eating and drinking. Uh, Over lockdown, me and my family got uh, 
caught up in the world of YouTube a little bit and we just watched video after video of, of people doing the craziest eating challenges. They would eat so much that you're like, it almost makes you repulse a little bit because you're like, in a minute, one more morsel, they're going to chunder. Like gluttons, absolute gluttons. That's the impression that Jesus gave off to people. And you're like, Jesus must have ate and drank a lot with people. So why? What was it all about? He spent loads of his time in his ministry eating and drinking. When he died and rose again, guess what he did with his disciples? They sat around the fire. What were they doing? They had eating. They had some nice fish. Nice fish supper. In heaven, guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be eating. It's going to be a banquet table. It's going to be a feast, a marriage feast. Jesus and the gospel, food and drink, hand in hand. Not because food and drink are special. They're an incredible gift. But because when done like Jesus, they scream the gospel, the good news of Jesus. If we can turn the tide and pay a little bit more attention to this son of man who came eating and drinking, I think there's tons of fruit to be had because we are living in a culture where communal eating and spending time with people around the table, there are more and more barriers and, and clashes than what we dare to imagine that stop us from doing that. I'm Italian by heritage and last summer we went for uh, an exploration with our girls back to the homeland as it were. Um, lovely family um, holiday with my parents and my brothers and their family. It was the last hurrah before they sold the, the family home out there. And again, I was struck by how people do food in Italy. Everything is like, nothing's particularly special, but it's, there's so much of it. People eat, you, you, so we were eat, you know, good British people, five, six o'clock, dinner time. Then we'd get ready and we'd go out for an ice cream for pudding, you know, a bit late, eight, nine o'clock. And we go out into town, we get the ice cream and we have a little, you know, nose around the town. And then we're walking back and there's families just sitting down for dinner at 10 p.m. At 10 p.m. And, and there's not just one, this isn't like, oh, I've had a really bad day at work, so I'm only just able to have a, a crumb of toast. They're like, the banquet table's out, they're all out on the balcony, all out in their gardens, there's, you know, sons, mothers, daughters, aunties, uncles, neighbours, they're all sat around this table, having the best time ever. And then I walk down the streets of, of Sheerness, I, I walk through London, and I look at the UK culture, uh, and what is it? It's eating on the go a lot of the time, isn't it? Snack pots, salads in a bowl, plastic bowl to make you feel, you know, like you're eating something that you should be. Constantly on the go, on the go. Everything's quick, microwavable, good, good, good. Fast food, not slow food. What, another barrier, we're so busy. Busy, busy, busy. Working longer hours, trying to fit more. Hands up if you felt like this week there's not enough hours for activity in your day and you just wish you had a couple of extra hours somewhere that you could just, you know. Stops you from slowing down eating with people tied to diaries and to calendars rather than just enjoying a different pace of life. In the UK, the home is now the castle. The front door is no longer uh, a passageway of, of welcome, but actually a shield and barrier to protect you from the world. We all like to think that we'd live with an open door policy. Yesterday morning, one of our, our ladies in our, in our flock Randomly turned up unannounced. <laughs> she lost her, well, her phone broke, got a new phone, no SIM card. So had no way to let us, let us know that she was coming around. Knock on the door, who is it? Oh, do that in your house, who is it? Oh, it's like a knock on the door is worse than the phone number that you don't know, isn't it? There's only one thing worse than a phone number that you don't recognize. It's a knock on the door and you don't know who's there. The girls are like, who is it, daddy? <laughs> Maybe we should answer the door and we'll find out. <laughs> I'm really sorry, our house was a state. I'd just come back from the gym with my dad. We'd been out late on Friday dancing to McFly at Dreamland. The, the, the house is trashed. And then suddenly you're like, 
I'm letting, I'm letting the shield down and I'm, I'm actually inviting this lady into our house. But actually that goes against our culture of keeping ourselves in our nice. Fear of rejection and ridicule. What if I ask someone to have a meal and they say no? Or worse, they say yes and then they hate my cooking. Actually, it's just easier if I don't. I read a really interesting um, article uh, this week about how the fact that there are still some families that eat dinner around the table. And they're really celebrating that. But the reality is so many of those meals are meals of distraction because there's always a screen on, whether that's a telly, whether that's a phone. Not just, you know, scrolling, scrolling, but, you know, someone texts, oh, I'll just answer that quickly, or oh, phone call. There's so much going against us being a people like Jesus who spent his time eating and drinking. So let's say we're going to stop. We're going to feast on Jesus for a moment. We're going to look at him. We're going to think about why. What do we see here? Why does Jesus do it? Because I truly think if we can understand the why, then we will grow in the how. So let's think about this. So Jesus, let's recap the story a little bit. He's just healed someone who's been paralyzed for years. And then he's walking along and he sees someone. Find out his name's Matthew, also called Levi in the Bible. Sat at his tax booth, maybe he was outside having a bit of a stretch, been a hard day at the tax booth in his little chair. He sees him and he goes over to him and he just says, come and follow me. And Levi's like, you know what, I will. And he gets up and he follows Jesus. Cut, straight, next scene, they're around the dinner table. Incredible, incredible thing happened. Jesus invites Matthew to friendship. And then the next thing we see is that they're around the table. I love the way the, the ESV just says, at table. At table. It's this, this thing of like, it's a centerpiece. It's not the table. It's almost like it's a, it's a person. It's a thing to be enjoyed. They're at table. And then enter the Pharisees. And they're outraged, absolutely outraged, sick to their stomach that Jesus is sat eating with the people that he's eating with. They felt, they probably felt so sick, a bit like me watching YouTube channels of people eating. They're so angry, so angry. How dare he eat with these? He claims to be all these things, to be from God to be the son of God, to be a prophet, to be a holy man. Yet he is eating with tax collectors and sinners. How dare you, Jesus? How dare you do that? How can you be a holy man, Jesus, and yet sit with these folk? That's their question. Jesus isn't afraid to answer. <laughs> See, the Pharisees lived by law plus. They like to think they're following the law of God and we're really good people. But there are so many things that they added on that raised the bar, that actually raised the bar. You can't, you can't come in here. They themselves, with their way that they lived and they exercised religion, had put so many barriers up that those on the outside had no way of getting in. Absolute no chance. <laughs> they were living, it's almost like this separatism is, is the one, is the word, uh, uh, a commentator used this way of separatism where they just separated themselves off from the rest of the community. If you weren't this, then you're not coming in. Moralism, division. They didn't want to invite people in because they were afraid that they'd make them unclean. So they decided to live in quarantine. <laughs> if you're not one of us, and you can only be one of us if you're born to be one of us and you follow all these rules. How do I ever get in then? Well, you just can't. You're not welcome. Walls shut. Up. Boom. Out. Living life of quarantine and keeping people out. You have no right to come and sit at my table and there's no chance that you'll ever be welcomed in. How miserable... <laughs> 
to be on the receiving hand of, of that experience. Imagine you are someone, you see this, um, this big community of people. Oh, well, you know what, that looks, that looks nice. I'm actually quite alone. I, you know, I've got nowhere else to be, nowhere else to belong. I'd love to come in. No, sorry, you can't. Thankfully, Jesus shares a better story. Thankfully, our God is a God of good news. We've been hearing testimony after testimony this morning about this good news God. Jesus is incredibly good news. He's not afraid to answer these questions. Verse 12 and 13, he goes in. They ask the disciples the question. Jesus hears and so he answers. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The son of man who came to seek and save the lost, to come to serve, not be served, to give his life as a ransom, puts that on display around the dinner table. Why did Jesus eat with people? Why did he spend so much time eating and drinking? Because it displays the gospel. It displays this amazing truth that the God of the universe, who created all things, invites us into friendship. The table was a place of friendship. Just like in Italy today, the culture then was if you were reclining at the table with someone, that meant you were good with them. You were friendship. And that is what Jesus is offering. Unlike the Pharisees, Jesus offers friendship to all who are on the outside, all who are cast aside, all who have no else, nowhere else to be. Jesus comes and offers friendship. This whole notion of uh, a desire mercy and not sacrifice comes from Hosea 6.6. 6. God talks about how he desires steadfast love and not sacrifices. The Pharisees lived all about rules and sacrifices and things to do, to do, to do, to do. You must do this, you must do this. Jesus came. Don't desire that. I desire love. Every meal with someone is a picture of Christ's love for them. Every time we see Jesus at the table, we see his love. We see his grace. We see his mercy that welcomes the lost home. That welcomes the one stray sheep to come back to the fold. He is a God of compassionate love. And so he used the dinner table to heal the separation between Humanity. He used it as a, as a centerpiece of life almost to display what he would one day do on a cross. Sin separates all humanity from the God of the Bible. Turning our back from God and his ways, trying to do life by ourselves without him in our lives, that's what the Bible classifies as sin. And the Bible tells us that we are all like sheep who have gone astray and so because of that, we're separated from God and his love and his goodness. But there's good news because Jesus came to do what? To heal the divide. Just as sin separated, sin separates humanity from God. Jesus healed that divide on the cross. And likewise, just as humans separate through sin, Jesus loves to come and bring reconciliation, to bring people to him, to draw people into community. Matthew himself was a sinner saved by grace, made friend of Jesus. This is the gospel. The dinner table is about the gospel. That's why Jesus did it. It put on display the radical love of a God of mercy 
and grace. Not one of rule keeping. Not one of harshness. Oh, sorry, you're not wearing the right attire. You can't come in here. You're not wearing a tie this evening, sir. Sorry, you can't come into this restaurant. Oh, your haircut's far too outlandish. No chance you can come and be with these kind of people. The love of Jesus makes the door very, very wide to the dining room. Why was he a man who ate and drank with people? Because he's a man who loved, who came to save. And we are invited to follow him in that. Now, when I was thinking about that, I was like, wow, that changes things. Because my dinner table is no longer just a thing for me that's just there to, you know, unless it's covered in washing, <laughs> which it often is. What's the dinner? We'll, we'll quickly have a bite to eat and then we'll move on. When I feast of my eyes and I think about the God of compassion who used the dinner table for something far greater, suddenly I want to use my dinner table a bit more. But we know that there's all these barriers. There's lots of things that can stop us from, we can have the heart right, but how do we actually step out in this? How can we grow to be like Jesus who uses the dinner table to speak the gospel? Well, firstly, we see that Jesus initiates. Jesus saw Matthew, saw him. I wonder how many other people would have walked past Matthew that day. Just like, oh, that's one of them. Or worse, I wonder how many people screamed abuse at Matthew that day. You dodgy tax collector. Tax collectors were hated, just in case you didn't know. Not only because they were greedy and often very corrupt and took more than what they should, but they also were seen by the people as traitors. They were doing the Romans' dirty bidding. And so they were enemies but what does the gospel say for whilst we were still his enemies christ died for us he's the god who loves his enemies and so matthew when jesus sees him jesus sees someone that he loves why because that's his radical grace that's his merciful compassion that is the good news of our gospel of our god is that there is no one <laughs> No one too far away from him. And so he sees Matthew, this tax collector. And what does he do? He initiates. He stands next to the books in Tesco and he has a conversation. Sees how many people would have walked past that, that lady that day. Just a face in the crowd. Jesus sees and so he does. Whether that's Matthew at the tax booth or whether that's Zacchaeus up on the tree. <laughs> Jesus often sees the ones that are overlooked, unloved, hated, and despised. And we see consistently through the gospel that Jesus sees and initiates conversation and compassion for these folk. He sees those that others don't, or worse still, those that others don't even want to. The ignored, the unloved, the unwelcomed. Who are we seeing in our day-to-day -day lives? Who is it that we're often catching our eye? That we're aware that they're there? Who can we initiate with? Are our eyes switched on? Are we, have we got too caught up in the, the busy, the, the rat race? The hamster wheel is what we often call it in our home. Just feels like we're just stuck in the hamster wheel, going round and round and round and round. Do we need to take a moment and jump off and say, Lord, help me to stop. Switch my eyes on, Lord. Eyes like Jesus who sees and initiates. My encouragement, friends, is go for the easy wins. Wherever you are, there's an easy win. Whatever you do in life. Now, what I'm not saying is now you need to go out, you need to ring in sick tomorrow and say, sorry, I can't come to work. I'm not saying just leave your kids at home, don't take them to school and, and just go on a wild one. I'm not saying drop all your responsibilities. In your day-to-day -day life, who are the people around you? 
maybe it's a lunch with a colleague. We've all got to eat. And I often think that's what Jesus did. He redeemed something that we've all got to do. It's inappropriate to, to do that with the toilet, but it's appropriate to do it at the dinner table. Yeah, we've all got to eat. We've all got to have some form of a drink. Who can you do that with? Where can be that spot in your week this week where you see someone and you go, you know what, Would you like? I'm about to go and eat. Would you like to come and share a sandwich with me? Or I'm about to go on lunch break in a moment. Or just finish dropping the kids off. Do you want to go for a quick coffee before we have to go? Who are you seeing? Who can you see? Move towards them. Initiate as Jesus does. Now, success with this isn't that next, next time you gather, you're all like, I've spoken to 15,000 people and they all said, yes, they'd love to have lunch with me and I've had so much lunch and you will come in like, <laughs> that's not success. Success is this, someone being asked. Someone being asked. The difference that that would make to someone in feeling loved is unbelievable. A couple of weeks ago, it was my friend's birthday. And um, I, I was I had lots of things on, and I knew that his his partner was at work, and the kids were at school, and I knew he was at home by himself. We were going to see him that evening, but I was like, oh, actually, you know what? My plans have kind of scuppered a little bit, and I was like, oh, should I text him? I was like, oh, actually, what if he says no? We're going to see him tonight. That's a bit keen, isn't it? Don't do it, Matt. Don't do it, Matt. And I was like, no, come on, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm, I'm preparing about this, so I better do it. So I text him, dude, any chance you want to come for a, a coffee and a, I'll buy you a bit of birthday cake? And then just sat there like, oh no, he's not messaged back yet. 30 seconds have gone, he's not instantaneously replied. What's, what's he going to say? Message me back. You know what, mate, that would be so nice. I'd love to. The, what that commu- the invitation, the initiation for me to him, I'd seen him and I'd text him. He felt so loved that day, he sent me a soppy text message. Mate, thank you so much. Now, there's been lots of times where I've initiated (laughs) and I've got no reply. Or I've initiated and it's been really awkward when we've actually met up and we've talked. It's not always going to go well. But what you are doing in communicating and initiating is we are communicating the gospel. You are seen and you are loved. And as I've received the love of Christ and have experienced that friendship and that love from him, I want to share that with you. And it doesn't have to mean that it's all crazy. It can just be a short half hour coffee. Just initiate. What else does Jesus do? So we can be a people who initiate. Jesus makes space. I love this about Jesus here. I really need to be like Jesus in this one. Okay. Jesus makes space. Jesus has just healed some folk. Jesus is in constant demand. If there's anyone that would, should decline a dinner invitation, it's probably Jesus. The guy was constantly on the go. He didn't know when his next rest was going to come. He had no place to lay his head. Healing people, preaching and teaching, people getting up on his grill, even when he was going off to withdraw, people follow him. Everywhere he went, Jesus was on the go. People are constantly everywhere. He could have easily sacked this meal off. You know what, Matthew? I've just invited you into friendship. Look, I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, here's the disciples. You just hang out with these fellas for a bit and I'll see you in a day or two. He could have easily have said that. Or worse, he could have entered that really half-heartedly. Like, yeah, I'll come and I'll just show my face, which we all know is code word for, I'm going to literally make sure that someone see me and I'm slipping out the back door and making a runner. Jesus could have done either of those things. But where do we find him at the dinner table? Reclining. Now, you need to be pretty committed to that social event to be reclining. When was the last time we reclined at the dinner table? That we were so relaxed, so unhurried, so set in that moment that we were like just kicking back. I'm not sure because I always get itchy feet. As soon as that last pea's eaten, it's like, all right, now we've got to do the washing up, now we've got to do this bit, and then we've got to do that bit. Jesus isn't bothered. The thing that's got Jesus' attention is not the jobs, not what he's going to do next. 
the moment that he's in. Jesus is making space, not just for food, but for people around the table. He is fully in the room. How much space and time is there in our calendar, in our daily life, or even week, that we can actually say, you know what, I'm going to scratch that bit out so that if I ever get a chance just to make space for someone, that's where I can say yes. I um, I drove this morning, which if you knew me five years ago, you'll know that that's changed because <laughs> I used to have to come up from here to Canterbury either by lift or by the bus. <laughs> and I'd come with a couple of boxes from the church offices back in Canterbury, like a, you know, a crazy man on the bus with these couple of boxes. But why have you got boxes with walkie-talkies in? Now I can drive. Now, the way you learn to drive is you have to find a decent enough driving instructor and spend far too much time and far too much money with this person. And that's what I did. So uh, last month, I passed my driving test. And I really, yeah, praise the Lord. He is alive. (laughs) Um, Now, my driving instructor, uh, Ben. uh, Ben, if you ever get to listen to this, thanks, mate. Um, We became good friends. We had a few things in common. And then he said, Matt, on the day of your driving test, if it goes well, mate, do you want to go for some chicken wings? Now, we'd spoken about food quite a bit, and chicken wings is like a joint love of ours. Now, I'm thinking, right, on that day, you're picking me up at 7. My test is at, like, 10. Nando's isn't going to open until half 11, so what's that? By the time I finish, if I do that, it's like six, seven hours out of my day. That's a whole working day done with one guy. (laughs) And then I'm like, in that moment, I've got a choice. Do I say yes and make space? Or do I say, you know what, mate, I've actually better go back and do some emails and I've got to preach to prep. And oh, yeah, that family of mine, I've got to see them at some point. And I decided that actually, you know what, I'm going to say yes. Regardless of whether I pass or fail, we're going to go for chicken wings. The amazing thing about making space for people is that you're giving them the greatest currency ever in today's world time. Now, if there's one thing I've learned about pioneering in Sheppey is that the best thing you could give anyone is your time. Why? Because it's the one thing that we don't have enough of anymore. Because people aren't in the habit, don't have those connections where they can slow down, actually think about their life. (laughs) It's the best thing about being sat at the table. We weren't hurried away. We just sat, refillable drinks, waiting for a chicken wings. So, mate, how's your week been? His son had broke his leg, three years old. Someone fell on him, snapped his femur. I had the opportunity. I texted in, you know, through the week, like, I'm praying for you, dude, et cetera, et cetera. I actually had the chance to just unhurriedly say, how are you feeling about that? What was that like as a dad? How's that affected you and your, your wife? And suddenly he's like, oh, actually, yeah, you know what? I feel a bit like this. And actually... Open tables opens hearts. If you've got an open table and you've got an open front door and you've got an open fridge and an open oven, eventually it's going to start opening up some hearts because you're slowing down, spending time together to think, to ask, to get to really know what's going on. And from that, you get to share something of Jesus with them. Now, I'm not saying you can only invite and hang out with your friends just to talk about Jesus. Please don't hear me, what I'm not saying, that it all, all becomes about that. It will just come out. Because they will ask you questions. What are you up to tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to church. Oh, why do you do that? Funny you should ask. Make space for people. Jesus did. Can we do the same? It might mean that we need to take a bit of time with our diary and a bit of time with our loved ones and say we need to do make a bit more space for hospitality. And that will mean sacrifices. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Having an open dinner table, we get to follow in the footsteps of the one who came from heaven to serve us in the most incredible way way and get to share that with those around us and the last thing i want to to us to think about is the generosity we see on display here 
growing in generosity. Matthew has just experienced the greatest generosity of all from Jesus. If you're really eagle-eyed in verse 9, you see that when Jesus says, follow me, it says, and he rose. Now that word rose, speaking about Matthew getting up, is the same word that is used when it talks about Jesus rose from the grave. What happened when Jesus rose from the grave? New life. What happens when Matthew decides to follow Jesus? New life. Everything for Matthew changed in that moment. Everything had changed. He had just encountered the incredible grace of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the friend. And what does he choose to do? He chose, he chose to host people. Who can I share this with? That was Matthew's thought. Now, we see that round the table, or at table, this isn't just Jesus and Matthew. There are many tax collectors and sinners and Jesus' disciples. There's loads of people here. How overwhelming to come home from work and then have all these people in your house. Now, we don't know whether he invited them. We don't know whether they turned up because they heard Jesus was in town and they saw him go in. We don't even know if it's just part of their daily routine. This was just when they normally ate together, all these tax collectors and sinners. We don't know which of the three it is. But what we do know is that Matthew is incredibly generous and says, come on in. Doesn't shoo them away. Oh my word, how am I, I haven't got enough food to feed Jesus if all these other people are here. Oh, come on in. Come on in. Come share a tape, spot at the table. What else could he have done? Could have just monopolized Jesus. No, he's my best friend. <laughs> he came and he saw me and I'm not sharing him with you. How dare you try and barge into my time with Jesus? He doesn't do that. He shows generosity. He could have kept what was his, his. It's a big challenge to us in the UK. We work hard for what we have and we do it all, and it's all mine because I've earned it. It's very countercultural these days to give stuff away. Unless it's to get some kind of accolade. I'm not saying that's a blanket everyone because there are incredibly kind-hearted people out there. But it's actually against the culture that says, work hard for what you have. Keep it. You've earned it. It's all yours. Matthew isn't like, that's not how he's operating now. He would have. That's how the tax collectors operated. I'm going to take more than what I should and it's all mine and I'm going to live a life of luxury. Jesus enters his life. Now he's given it all away. Doesn't care. There's not enough bread that he could share with people. There's not enough fish that he could have given out. Wine to be shared. He's sharing life with this incredible, incredible generosity. Generosity that he received from Christ in his offer of friendship. He's now extending to those around him. What's happening here is Matthew's heart is full of gospel gratitude. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And the res result of that gospel gratitude is gospel generosity Jesus words when he says he who is forgiven much loves much are very challenging especially when it comes to generosity <laughs> he who is forgiven much loves much Matthew would have been forgiven much and now he's loving those around him much and showing generosity we will grow in generous eating and drinking with people when our hearts are more full and more full and more full of gospel gratitude. Now, what this isn't, what I'm not saying here, right? Generosity isn't about giving loads. It isn't about being really impressive with what you're giving away. It's about being willing to share what you have and giving it with a heart full of love, okay? I'm not saying you need to go and put on banquets every single lunchtime. Invite all your neighborhood around for the most impressive breakfast that they've ever seen. That's not what I'm saying. 
It can be the smallest of things. Once a Sunday, once a month on a Sunday, we share a community lunch at the end of our, our time together. And it's a right mismatch. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring bread and some other bits and we'll see what happens, kind of jobby. Our friend, who's from an unchurched background, she came along one Sunday with her daughter. And uh, she's like, oh, what's that over there? And we're like, oh, after we've done worship and prayed together, we're going to have bacon sandwiches. To her daughter, she was like, Holly, did you hear that? Bacon sandwiches. That's amazing. Why? And I was like, oh, no, it's a really good question. Why are we doing this? For that very reason. <laughs> A simple bacon sandwich with a bit of white bread from Tesco, Neville's bread. It's good bread. And some bacon that's been sat in a slow cooker for far too long. Put them together with a bit of ketchup and love. Suddenly, people encounter the grace of Jesus because they're blown away by simple generosity. She felt so loved. And it's amazing because you know who's here? Matthew, Jesus, and the disciples. It's not a solo effort. Guys, guess what? We're family. And you know what the best thing about being family is? We get to do things together. And so as we're sharing community lunch together, my girls are going, Dad, can we go and see if the ladies out on the desk want a cup of tea? Uh, yeah. <laughs> can we give them the leftovers? Can we see if they want the cake? Yeah. We've had some incredible, incredible conversations with the ladies that work at the leisure center where we meet on a Sunday. All kinds of conversations, chats, opportunities to share the gospel with them because my girls showed incredible generosity. Simple, a mushed up little bit of cake and a cup of tea. But it's opened their hearts. Wow, these people really care. All they do... Is, is sit at the desk, someone scans in, all right, yeah, see you later, and they go. That's what they're used to. And then these two balls of energy say, do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my word, please don't scold yourselves. But we get to do it together. It's a family meal. My favorite times growing up were Boxing Day. Big Italian family. We used to gather all together, and we used to put on a meal for everyone in our family. We had the best fun putting it on. We get to do this together. The world needs a better story. The world needs the love of Christ. The world needs community centered on the centerpiece of Christ's love for them. We get to share that with the world. One way is by eating and drinking with them. Who can you see? Who can you initiate? Who can you make space for this week? Who can you show generosity to? Why? Because we believe the Son of Man is the one who comes to seek and save the lost. Who came not to be served, but to serve and gave his life as a ransom. And so we're going to respond today by sharing a meal together. <laughs> Isn't it so kind of Jesus? <laughs> he sets it all up for us. <laughs> It makes it very simple sometimes. We get to share in this meal where we will share it with bread, the body of broken Jesus. We remember the body of Jesus broken for us. Why? Because he loves us. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son to make forgiveness of sins possible. We are here today because we have encountered the loving grace of Jesus. And now we get to share this meal together. The Bible says we've all been separated from God because of our sin. The wages of sin is death and separation from God. When Adam and Eve turn their back on God, we see two things happen. They're cast out of the Garden of Eden. And the wages of that is going to be they're going to die. And there are two things that have just like two rushing rivers throughout the whole of hu humanity, throughout all of human history. The, the reality is we're born as enemies of God because we do not love God. And that means we're separated from him and his love, the goodness of Eden. When you look at the goodness of Eden, when you look at the very beginning of the story, what a wonderful place. 
What a wonderful place. The evil that we encounter in this world is nowhere near it. But humanity turned their back on him. And he didn't keep that door closed. (laughs) Didn't have a pharisaical heart. Actually, you're not coming in. Have you seen the state of your week this week? No. What does he do? He makes a way for all to come to know him. If you're here this morning and you do not know the love of Jesus, know this, that he loves you. He sees you. He never stopped loving humanity, even when they turned their back on him. He reached down in love, entered this earth, lived as one of us, and died a sinner's death. So that by his wounds, we can be healed. The separation from God that we deserve, that our sin has caused, he has healed. Which means we can be friends with God. His invitation is for eternal life. All who believe in him will receive eternal life. And we get to enjoy the goodness of, of his kingdom today until one day he returns and we get to enjoy it forever. And we join with him at the wedding feast between him and his people, feasting on his pure beauty and brilliance, but also feasting and enjoying food together. What an amazing God we serve. He came eating and drinking. Amen, he did. (laughs) Thanks be to God. Let's pray and then we'll share communion together. Um, If you're unable to come up to the table, Ben and Brian will uh, happily come and and, uh, give it to you. Um, So yeah, let's pray together. Let's take a moment to pause and be still. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are a God of good news. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us. We rejoice that you are the God that goes after the one lost sheep. Lord, how much we needed saving. Thank you that you came to us. You called us by name. In your rich love, in your grace and your mercy, you came. Jesus, we thank you so much for your your invitation to friendship. I pray that as we share in communion together, Lord Jesus, we would know afresh the beauty, the brilliance of friendship with you. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you are a God who sees. Help us to see as you see. Thank you so much that you are the God who makes space for people. Help us to make space for those around us. Thank you, Lord, that you gave your life. How much more generous could could someone be than laying down their life for those he calls friends? And you did that whilst we were enemies, Lord. Help us to be generous. As we receive and enjoy and celebrate your generosity towards us, help us to be those that extend that to those around us. Help us, Lord, this week to grow as a people who eat and drink well, following your st- footsteps. Thank you that it all points to you, your gospel and your glory. Amen. Thank you.